I am getting in a different seat this week on the podcast, and I am about to be the one being interviewed. I am bringing on a very special secret host today that is going to lead us and is going to ask all the juicy questions about me. We're going to talk personal stuff. We're going to talk business stuff, uh, but it's nice to take a break, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Best Damn Coach Podcast listeners, this is not Amanda Walker. It's your buddy, Adam, from Podcasting Business School. I am actually taking over today, and I'm going to interview your girl, our girl, the best damn coach herself, Amanda Walker. So we're flipping it. We're going to find out all the things you ever want to find out about the amazing Amanda Walker. Uh, she just did this for my show. I feel tons of pressure. She was so <laughs> great in, in the interview on my show. I'm nervous now, though. I wasn't nervous when I interviewed you. I don't know what's up your sleeve. So now I'm feeling a slight bit of nerves. Well, I'm, I'm a gamer. I'm a game time performer. So like when the pressure's I'm on, yep. I'm at my best. Yes. Uh, sure. but no, I have so many curiosities about you and uh, we're going to dig into like what's the behind the scenes story of, of Amanda Walker, the best damn coach. So, uh, you ready, you ready to dive into this? I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Nothing thought, off limits, no gatekeeping, oh okay. all honesty. Okay. So I want to hear some stories. I, I want you to tell me this, a story. You can pick which one that gives us a little bit of insight of Amanda as a kid. Um, I was bossy um, and I, no, not any different than I am now. And when I wanted something, I would go make it happen. And so when I was young, we as a family used to go to this bar slash restaurant called Mr. Lucky. So if you're a native <laughs> Arizonan, you know about Mr. Lucky's. It's in a horrendous part of town now. It's since closed. Sadly, it just so sad. But we used to go there for fri Friday, Friday night fish fry. It's very epic. And they also had a children's lip syncing contest. And so yes. I went and I saw the kids on stage and I was like, hmm, I want to be that child. And so, of course, went to the banks. We'd been professional lip syncers on the weekend. We had these amazing family friends that I grew up with. And so, you know, like girls do, you lip sync and dance and you like try to put on shows for your parents, which they're so irritated by, I'm sure. But you think you're so good. And so I went to my parents and I said, I'd like to do the lip syncing contest, but here's the thing. Here is the song I chose, Tina Turner's What's Love Got to Do With It. Like yes. of all the songs, I don't even know. Um, and so I practice, practice, and I have, I had like, you know, now I pay, you know, to have some of the blonde in my hair, but back in the day I was this toe head blonde hair down to my, like everything Tina Turner is not, but I loved her soul. I was like such a Motown fan. I listened to Motown growing up with my mom, listened to so much music with my parents in general. And so I practiced rehearsing the mirror. I went, um, first round crushed it, totally won that night. Um, and I remember so pumped. I got like a $200 gift card or gift certificate at the time. It was like a physical gift certificate to this yeah. store and I got to go there and I thought it was so cool. So then I make long story short, I make it to the finals and my mom sews me up this cause she was seamstress. She made all my dance <laughs> costumes. She makes yes. me an epic Tina Turner. I'm going to have to find the pictures too. Oh my God. Tina Turner dress. It's like black, you know, t kind of fitted Tina Turner style, kind of fringy. And I felt so diva ish in that I go to the finals and I limp sync, lip sync my little heart out. And then I get beat. I'm probably six at the time, by the way, guys, if I forgot to mention oh, that six no. or seven. And I get beat by like this teenager who sings, um, one eyed, one haired, purple people eater song. And I was flat out devastated, but resilient. I moved on. But yeah, I think that kind of like the same person I am now, like if I want something, I go after it. And probably sometimes that's also a fault is I'm just like tunnel vision. Let's do this. Get out of my way. So yeah, that's Amanda as a kid. I have so many follow-up questions for this. <laughs> like we could probably spend a full hour talking about this <laughs> lip syncing contest, but I'll, I'll just leave it at one. If you, if there were an adult version of this today, what what's your song like it's all on the line i already know whitney houston i want I, I want to dance with somebody i know it because i listen to it every tuesday by the way i have a live <laughs> webinar i listen to that song before i go live if it were to be my it would be my walk-up song it is actually been on some speaking events it's my walk-up song so i'm here for the whitney i mean do you feel like a good lip sync performance like what puts it over the top obviously you got the outfit but like 
are you like moving around? Like, are you like, yeah. really, are you performing? Yeah, like, you have to key? perform. I don't know if I really performed that well, or if I was just a cute little six year old blonde kid that they felt sorry for, honestly. <laughs> Um, but I think nowadays, yeah, you got to really like sell it. You got to do all of the motions. You got to like feel the emotion in it. So, yeah. I feel like, like some sort of air guitar would be appropriate as yeah, well. Totally. Yeah. If the song's appropriate, you definitely don't want to hear me karaoke though. <laughs> 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 we'll stick, stick with the lip sync. If you go to Podfest next year, I know what I'm going to, I'm going to pull you oh, to the karaoke gosh. stage. I've well, never karaoke in my life, actually. It's probably one I, of the I think we should fears. do like uh, regulate uh, Warren, oh, G Warren G and G, uh, here for Nate it. Dog. Okay, yep. Cool. All right. Um, or salt and pepper. There we go. Just Any salt, salt and pepper. Yeah. Uh, I don't even care which one I am. I'll yep. be either. I can be either. <laughs> uh, either condiment, salt or pepper. Good to go. Uh, all right. You have an athletic background. I, one of, one of the things that drew me to you, I, I like fell in love with your podcast and then I see the Instagram and you're shooting hoops. I'm like, this is awesome. I was really impressed because I thought you were a lefty. I'm like, that's a sweet looking lefty jump shot. Know, and you're like, sorry, this. idiot. It's just like the, <laughs> the reverse film of it's, you know, my camera's facing the other way. I'm like, still impressive. Looks good. Um, tell us about like your athletic background. Like what was your, were you a hooper? Like, did you play in high school? Like give us a little bit of that, that high school athletic background. Yeah. I wasn't a hooper actually till seventh grade. I was a dancer, which is weird. So I spent four nights a week at the studio dancing from like four to nine or 10. I loved dance. Wow. And then, um, sixth grade recess, I decided I wanted to like get out there with the boys and learn how to play basketball and fell in love with it and started going to camps. Um, my dad started coaching me at like local, uh, you know, YMCA league or whatever, and just fell in love. And I remember critical moment in parenting history, like shout out to my parents. They're amazing. But so many things that like moments as I wanted to quit dance and I was locked into a team, right? Very competitive. The dance world's bananas. And, um, they made me physically call my coach and tell her over the phone. And I was so pissed at them. And also it was like one of the greatest growth opportunities for me. Um, just as we're talking about that. And so started playing club basketball. We had a really great high school team. My coach was my dad's best friend. He was the varsity coach. And I remember in junior high, my parents worked and I wanted to play summer camps. And so he had a young daughter and the deal was like, I would watch her while he was like leading some of the camps that were like older than me. But then I got to like drive everywhere with him and participate and be in the gym, be a gym rat all day and just be around basketball. So that's when I started playing pretty competitively through high school. I uh, played varsity all four years, started varsity all four years oh. at the two, uh, two mostly. And so we had a, an amazing, I just had an amazing high school basketball experience and definitely wanted to play college ball till about junior year. A lot happened. That coach who was such a great influence on me passed away of cancer and it really like, ugh stripped us all in the middle of the season, to be honest. Um, we were like going through it with him. It was a quick diagnosis, pretty devastating because we were all super tight unit. Um, and nonetheless, our assistant coaches, one of my dad being one of them, I was like the coach's daughter, which was definitely rough at times, but at least I had the street cred to, to back it up. Um, and our other coach wasn't a teacher. So they brought in another teacher who we had no rapport with to like finish coach. We were pissed. We were just honestly, he ended up being so amazing for us in senior year, but I kind of lost this little bit of fire and decided biggest regret right here. Here it is um, that I didn't want to play basketball in college. I had opportunities and I decided I wanted to stay cl closer to home, had a full academic scholarship for undergrad. And to this day, I am sad about that decision because um, I wished I would have went and played somewhere, but, um, I was a homesick girl tight with my parents, a little afraid to go too far. So I totally let fear drive me. And I think that's why I'm so opposing it now, but that's a little bit about the background of basketball. That's interesting. I, I mean, I think as a, a young person seeing somebody get cancer and, and die, that's something that's really important to you, like a, a person that's important in your life. That's rough for, a group of people like that. I, I mean, I had a similar experience where my, my senior year, I've, I had full intention to play basketball and I played in a game where a kid died on the court. And, mm. you know, one of the, like the heart issue things that you hear about every once in a while happening. And that took a lot of wind out of my sails. Like that really shifted things kind of in a similar way. Like, do you, do you guys, sure. like as a team, how did you guys handle that? Cause I remember like, 
we had to go to the funeral as a team. And I, I just, and we still like that group of people were still kind of connected by that moment of, of that, that point in our life. And remembering like, this was like a major thing for 17 and 18 year olds to freaking go through. Like, did you have anything like that? Did you notice anything like that as far as like you guys bonding together and just kind of helping each other deal with that? Man, I wish I could be really magical and say yes to that. I think it was also such like we were headed into state, like there was just a lot of tension going on and, you know, seniors were headed out. I I'm sadly would just say like that, I think we're linked to, to, to it now. We can look back at hindsight now and see like what an important time was. Um, we were very connected to the family. Like my coach would spend evening, he would literally, he lived about a mile away. So sometimes he would just show up at our doors. He's like the quirkiest He's like, he's like Bob Ross esque, like hair crazy. Yes. And he would just show up like at our house randomly. Cause we got the newspaper and just like sit down and like have breakfast randomly. And just like, he was so fun and bizarre. I had the opportunity to actually speak at his funeral and that was super special for me. Um, and I think hindsight is always different. We can look back and be like, Oh, remember him for me and my family. I think because we were such a support system for his wife and his daughter at the time, I think, I don't know that I connected as much to my team at the time. Um, but we rallied back the next season and, you know, we had a great season, um, you know, in his honor for sure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. All right. High school. We're, we're talking about high school. If you had to pick one band or one musical artist that would play the soundtrack to your high school years, what band or artist would that be? So if this is any indication of what kind of music I listen to, I drove an 87 Honda Prelude stick shift, of course, and it had a giant Nike swoosh on my back window. So, so cool. I definitely was a hip hop lover, loved okay. rap music and hip hop. So that would be the genre. And if I were to get more specific, I would have to, I'm, I'm a, I don't even want to say the one artist's name because he's in a crap ton of trouble right now. So we're just going <laughs> to whoop push him right out. Um, Mace is definitely in there. I would definitely say some Mace is in there, but man, I loved R and B and hip hop and Mary J Blige um, would be definitely um, I played like just like her albums. I think two albums came out during high school over and over. That was definitely playing in my car. Um, like SWV, um, a lot of those R and B kind of soul voices were definitely, and then I'd throw in some rap, and then occasional like Tupac would fly in there or something like that. So, but it's definitely that hip hop, rap, R and B genre for sure. I was not like into Three Eleven or Nirvana or I don't know, like Stained, Metallica. That's definitely my husband's world. Oh, this is why me and your husband need to meet and hang. Yes, out. you guys definitely. You just named my list of bands. I'm there like, you wow, go. This is those are all the ones I listen to in my Jinko jeans. Uh, any any wardrobe that you're like, oh my god, I can't believe that I have pictures of myself in, in this. No, outfit. because it's all popular right now. My daughter is like, mom, how did you not keep anything from the nineties? Cause I feel like I go shopping right here right now with her and like Tilly's and some of the department stores. And like, this is what we all wore. And so I don't feel shameful. Now I feel like so proud and I'm wishing I would have kept it. Like this, like walking into the set of clueless or express back in the day when it used to be cool. And the guys would shop at structure. Um, I don't feel like I'm embarrassed other than I just taught, I just showed my kids the tearaway pants. Like I, I had, they didn't understand that that was like a real thing. I'm like, no, like before every game, that's what we did. We wore a Jersey oh, yeah. and you betcha, if you were starting five, you got to rip those little buttons right open. And there you had your tearaways. So that was like, you know, moment of, of glory for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the tearaway pants, that's like standard basketball, you know, like that's, I remember I one of my best like friends. I don't they do it anymore though. Do they not? Is it inappropriate or something? Like, is nah, it... I don't know. I'm just trying, we watch a lot of the high school basketball here and I feel like they're only warming up in shorts. I don't know, but I, I got to pay more attention. Now we got to bring, some, mission, some, bring back tearaways. <laughs> yeah, somebody needs to research that out in the audience. Is, is tearaway pants, uh, have, have tearaway pants been canceled out there in, in the, the sports world? I don't Please know. Please don't like, cancel them. Bring them back. <laughs> bring back tearaway pants. We had the candy striped tearaway pants. Oh, like those the, are cool. Like Harlem Globetrotter status. Yes, exactly. Yep. Very nice. Very so nice. Fun. Now, you met your husband. You meet him in high school? Is that, is that what you high. Junior high. Tell us about this. I know there was a story with this. Uh, yeah. Junior high. Yeah. I mean. We, we didn't start dating then, but that's definitely when we met. We met right. 
um, seventh grade, I was waiting to get picked up and he walked up to me and was like, I I picture him perfectly. He was holding on to his backpack, walking up to me, didn't know who he was and was like, are you dating? And then said this boy's name. And I was like, what's the boy's name? I I would like to know the boy's name. Oh my gosh. No way. I can't even say it right now. His name was Jeff Frank, (laughs) Jeff Frank. Uh, my, out, any Jeff. friends who listen to this. <laughs> um, and uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. And he's like, oh, cool. And then he like walked away. But smart move on his end. Um, he always talks about like, I had this in my heart to ask. It was totally all meant to be. It played out the rest of our relationship is I noticed him now. I noticed his face. And so we were in like honors. We were total honors geeks. And so we had classes together and um, he notoriously came to my rescue in math class. And so um, that's how we struck up a friendship and became fast friends by eighth grade, best friends, you know, by like ninth grade. He had a really serious girlfriend pretty much throughout high school. I had a really serious boyfriend throughout high school, sadly. <laughs> um, not Jeff Frank. And um, We're by the Jeff time- the bus today. I know. I know. Sorry, Jeff. He was a nice guy. I don't know where he is now. Um, and by the time we got to- um, you know, senior, I just remember my mom was always like, why don't you date that Justin Walker? He's such a sweet kid. And all along, I really always had this thing for him, to be honest. Like we would hang up with our boyfriend and girlfriend at the time, but we were always like the last phone call of the night, always the go-to. Um, and at the time, you know, I had like the clear phone that you could see all the cords and it actually like plugged into the wall and the cord was like 300 feet long. I had a curfew of 10, but my mom once heard once had that nudge got on the phone and was like amanda get off the phone you know that was back in the time where kids are sat our kids aren't gonna miss out on this whole experience of like us as parents getting able to like screen their phone call because you pick up the downstairs line without anybody knowing um but yeah so we started uh dating our senior year we went to prom together senior year and um literally have been together since um haven't broke up and so we've been dating since we're about 17. I feel like this story could be like a Ryan Reynolds movie from the early nineties. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> could be. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My life story. I think, I don't think my husband would oppose if Ryan Reynolds played him. I See? just got to think of the female actress that would play you me, know, but somebody that's into Mary J. Blige. Yeah. And, you yeah. Know, yeah. You know, Lover of hip hop. Yep. Probably like, you know, Drew Barrymore or somebody like that. Who knows? You know, like that's, Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Early Drew Barrymore. Early. So, Tell me about the, the, the proposal, the, like what uh, you guys have known each other. I feel like that's a different level. You've known each other for freaking a, a decade or whatever, you know, and then, you know, it's time to pop the question. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. I mean, we dated a long time. We were both, you know, he was headed out to play college football. I was doing my thing. So there was definitely moments of like, we actually both had, before we started dating, had um, committed to going to NAU, which is about two hours north. He was playing football there. Um, That year was tough. Like you're just transitioning. He's playing a college sport, which is super demanding. So we were finding our way. And I was always steadfast, this independent woman, like, uh, until he puts a ring on it, I'm buying my own house. And like, we've been knowing, we, we, we dated for like six or seven years. And so um, he out of nowhere planned this trip to California to us. And at the time he was, he was working security. I mean, kudos to him. He is a worker. His dad died of a heart attack when he was 10. So it was his mom, solo status and his brother. So he worked all through high school in addition to playing sports and getting straight A's. I'm like tooting his horn right now, but I've just always had so much respect for him around that and helping his mom with fun. So he was playing after the first year he came home to play uh, junior college ball before he would eventually go play uh, D1. But, um, but he was working, doing all the things and he randomly, um, booked us this trip to California. I was like, this is not like him. And I remember I didn't get it at the time, but when we went through security at the airport, he like went in a different line all of a sudden than me. And I was like, what are you doing? Like we should stay together. Um, and so like second night there, he had planned this meal. We, um, at this restaurant called Jake's, it's like oceanfront. We just took our kids there this summer for the first time. And, um, after that, it was, it was very, it could be very Ryan, Ryan Reynolds rom-com. Um, it was like slight drizzle. He took me for a walk out on the beach and then boom, out of nowhere, uh, popped the question. I was like, Oh, this is all making sense now. And so, oh. um, yeah, then we were engaged for about a year and a half and got married in 06. That's, that's good. Smooth move. Show yeah. Me. I mean, very smooth. He's, yeah. he is the romantic and I am not that way at all. He's like <laughs> the super sensitive one, lovey romance. And I am like, 
okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm working. That's been a work in progress because I'm trying yeah. to meet, meet his style as well. The softening of Amanda Walker's heart. Yes, for sure. Um, now I know you're a proud mom. Uh, and obviously like you, it's obvious when you are, post if you guys follow Amanda on, on Instagram and you should, um, you just feel that pride coming through when you're like doing family things. And when you showcase your, your children a little bit, when was the first time that you had like that big prideful moment in, in either your kids or, or maybe you could do, you know, both like, when was the first time you're like, Oh my God, I'm so proud of this kid. Man, that's hard to say. Cause I know as little kids, I think any, you know, you see your child go out of the way to show their character. You are kind of like, notch in your parent belt of like, okay, right. Because I'm doing this. And I always remember people would tell me, you know, your kids are going to be the craziest and we the best and worst with uh, the worst with you at home. And they're going to go out. And if you've done a good job, they're going to be their best to other people. And so anytime, you know, you can see those moments, um, you know, are fantastic. But I remember Mackie, my daughter, McKenna, I call her Mackie. She'll die if she just heard that live. Um, <laughs> Uh, she had this little friend that was really shy in preschool. And I, um, we were, we took the kids to like a co-op style preschool. So we got to volunteer and be super hands-on there. And, um, I just remember she was like me, like mom, a little bossy. And she had this like lisp when she was little too. It's just the sweetest thing. And, um, I just remember this boy, she really loved playing with, and they would get in like a rhythm and play together, but he was always like shy to, to, to move in. And I just remember very clearly one day she just reached back and grabbed his hand and was like, well, just come on, let's go. Right. And I think that's been a lot of things that make me proud about her is just always inviting people in, which I think I lacked the, the self-confidence to do a lot. Um, and so I would say the same with our son, you know, his, his strength is, I mean, to, to our goal is just to like remind him like chivalry is not dead. Um, and we really pride ourselves on like taking care of like still the opening of the doors. That's still important. The like acknowledging your elders. Um, and so one of my favorite things is my grandma passed last April. She was a hundred when she passed, but they had like this unique special relationship. And so I just always felt so fulfilled starting from a young age. He was just so connected to her and so engaged. So she would tell stories and he was locked in. Like he never rushed it. Right. He was just always so present for her. Um, so those things in this moment are, are what come top of mind for sure. That's, that's, and that's good. Uh, like it's gonna make you feel good to have that kind of longevity in your, in your family line too. And that, my other grandma like, just passed and she was 99 on my mom's side. Let's go. So the ladies, the ladies are here for it. Well done. Well done. Now I want to ask you about a term that can be, maybe be a little bit controversial. And that term is stay at home mom. Like, um, oh, good. How do you feel about that 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 phrase? I'll I'll just stop talking and, and let you roll. I mean, I think it can be a fact. If you are a stay at home mom, then that means you mom at your house. Um, but I also think that that term is you know obviously used out of context because you're never just like staying at home. You're doing all the things. What I will say is I've been lots of things. I've been a mom who's stayed at home and hasn't worked. I've been a mom that stayed at home and has worked part-time. I have been a mom that didn't stay at home and worked out of the house. And I don't think there's a lot of women maybe that have tried all those hats. And so the thing that honestly pisses me off about this top, this like word is that as females, we use it against one another. And that is the devastating part for me of like, but stay at home moms have it the best, but work at home moms. I'm like, hey, friends, did y'all know we're, we're on the same team over here? And because I feel like I've fulfilled lots of roles and I've stayed at home to do them, but I've also left the home to do them. There is not one that's easier <laughs> than the other. Um, but I do know when I was staying at home with no other passion, I felt the least connected to my purpose. And so I, I knew specifically for me that exclusively staying at home with no other identifiable external job was not going to be like how I could contribute to the world and, and be the happiest version of myself. And so, um, yeah, does that, does that answer your yeah. question? <laughs> okay. Follow-up question. I feel like... Now, okay, question before the follow-up question. Your husband is entrepreneurial now, correct? Like he is 
retired military and, and retired PD. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, okay. I feel like a lot of families that are like one entrepreneur, one not, or even just entrepreneur parents and kids that are being kids. I mean, do you feel like your, your children specifically understand like who you are as an entrepreneur and like you're very, very successful, like big deal community builder. Do you feel like they have any sense of that at all? Or are they just like mom is mom? I think I made a mess. So my greatest struggle was when Justin was still on the PD. I mean, he's, he was an entrepreneur well before. I mean, he's had his business longer than mine, to be honest, but wasn't necessarily all in and probably until the last like, five years or so before retirement, obviously now he's retired. But I think my greatest struggling point was when I was starting business and my kids were probably four and six at the time, you know, that five to seven, like perfect world. I wouldn't have started business yet. I would have like got at least one into kindergarten and figured some stuff out, but you know, it's not on your time and it started happening. And so I, I rolled with it, but that was also my most frustrated moments because Justin was on the SWAT team. Our life was 100 million percent unpredictable. He was gone at the drop of a dime. There was just nothing I could do. So I had a lot of resentment towards him and a lot of it like, when's it going to be my time? Because for the next, honestly, years after that, it felt like everything was revolving around his career because it was a time his career was unpredictable where I had this teaching job that was, you know, completely stable. I could predict the hours. And so once I left that and I was home, I was always like, but what about me? When am I going to get mine kind of uh, feeling? And so I tried, I think too hard to separate the kids in this bucket and my business in this bucket. And I remember he just one day like trying to love on me, but also like, Hey, I'm the breadwinner at the time. <laughs> He's bringing in the dough. I've stepped away from my career. We've kind of accepted that I'm going to be focused primarily on the kids. Then all of a sudden this business thing happens. We don't know at the time where it's going to go and that our roles will, you know, soon be shifting. But, um, he was like, well, have you ever just like invited them in to like play office with you? Like set up a table, put out some coloring stuff. Like, you know, if you can get a good hour out of that. And I was like, I'm so angry at you right now. Why didn't I think of this? Um, I say that to then realize that I have to bring my kids more into the business to help them understand the depth and breadth of, of what we're doing. And so I don't think they think, oh, wow, cool. Um, there's definitely moments where I'll have big revenue weeks or big revenue months and I will just like externally celebrate at the dinner table. And I don't think they still even understand the depth and breadth of that, kind, you know, month. and so, but I do try to loop them in. I'm just like celebrating the wins, like telling them oh, like Tuesdays are my big batching day. They know today it's like six episode day. What do you guys want to do today? So I have one kid that's hanging out all day with his friends. Uh, the other kid has like a regular babysitting job and she knows like I'm going to have 15 minutes. So I think it's it's so much about we try to I at least try to compartmentalize and now it's so much more awesome when you can bring them in and celebrate the milestones and share the goals and I think they're 14 and 12 they're starting to like comprehend that now that's so cool and I, I feel like that's that's really important that's a great way to go about it of just like kind of getting them plugged in taking them along the journey with you even if they don't 100 percent get it I think that when they're older they'll be able to look back and go oh you know man my mom and you know, the thing that I think about as podcasters is that I wish I had hundreds of conversations that my parents, at, like I, I could go back and review and listen, do it whenever I wanted to, when I'm, you know, when, when they're gone or whatever. I think that's a, a cool asset to have videos and all this stuff. Like you can go back and see that's what, so true. what your parent did, you know, yeah, so that's going to be, that's going to be pretty neat. And I think, you know, from a text even non-tax perspective, I mean, we have our kids do stuff in our business, right? Like we as a family are always packaging knives up for Justin when orders come in. They know how to operate the shop. They've organized the shop. They organize my office. Like any way I can find small jobs for them to, it's hard, It's harder in my business since everything is so digital and a higher, I think a higher skill in, in a lot of ways where for us in the shop, like, you know, obviously he has a lot of high skill stuff too, but, um, it's also nice to like loop them in to, to, to the tasks. And this is drove a lot of, um, you know, why we home are homeschooling Miller for a couple of years too, is to be able to pour that entrepreneurial spirit into him in some way, whether or not he runs a business, we're unattached to that, but to have the depth and like the, the time to, and, and create the deep conversations around some of those life skills, like you and I, I'm sure learned. So I, 
I really didn't, I never knew what a profit and loss even was, you know, until I started business that wasn't anything that I had learned or how to, you know, run expenses or look at cost of goods or anything like that. And so he gets to learn all of that. A, because Justin and I are in a position where we can prioritize that. It's not easy. I want to say that like it does drive strategic discussions around how we're going to spend our time. But um, it's really fun to be able to take this little moment of time to also teach some of the stuff we've learned through business building too. Yeah. And I think it's so valuable for a kid just to have the entrepreneurial door opened in their mind. Like my, my dad was a pharmacist. My mom was a pharmacy tech and I, I didn't know any entrepreneurs in my family and I had to figure it all out. So I think having, it's a real advantage when obviously totally. we don't push our kids to do anything, but just being like, Hey, this is an option. And mm -hmm. I know I have conversations with my son, especially where I'm like, Hey, you know how sometimes you don't really like the teachers, how they kind of boss you around. I'm like, that's why I'm an entrepreneur because I don't like anybody bossing me around yeah. ever. Um, so I kind or of like, just like drop a little nuggets. Yeah, it's good. Or like, Hey, do you know, like sometimes when you don't want to do that thing, like sometimes in life we have to do the things we don't want to, like there's, there's some things in my business I don't really want to do. They're not very fun, but I know it's important to move the greater thing forward. And so, yeah, there's so many great learnings. All right. I want to bring it home with uh, a big question. You know, obviously like I said, I follow you on the gram and your stories and everything. I like how you open up and kind of let people into your world a little bit. Uh, it seems like you, you're doing a lot of self-improvement and really digging in with your faith. Can you tell us just like that self-improvement and, and, you know, you and your husband, you seem to really be going on, on a journey, like what that, that means to you when you're working on your faith and things like that. That seems like it's a big part of who you are right now. Yeah. I mean, I think self-improvement has been a part of who I always was. I think business um, like creating a business, my first year, two years of business, I will say, turned me into this, like showcased me this kind of personal development world that I would say was agnostic, not faith driven whatsoever. Um, and it was such a great opportunity, like just adding more coaching tools under my belt, but being in the, in the presence of other people that wanted to grow and kind of seeing the opportunity to like work on my own emotional IQ, if you will. And then I grew up not in a, in a house uh, that talked about faith, talked about God, the universe or anything. And so I was really approaching life with a blank canvas and no filters around that, which I'm so grateful for. My parents were like, we're so sorry. I'm like, no, no, no. It's great. I'm happy about it. Um, and of course, then you have kids and you're like, whoa, like this is pretty cool. How did this happen? And you look back at your story of like how Justin met me in the seventh grade. And that was like the catalyst, like all these things. It's like that, you know, that, um, if you could like rewind and it's like a movie and you see all these like little things. And so it also came at a time where, you know, I was at a pivot in my business where we built this health and fitness brand that I loved and also was exhausted by, and I'm trying to build this kind of business coaching, um, side of things. And I was tapped out, like just not having fun, not loving life, feeling like I did not get into this for this reason. And so that's when we made the decision to kind of shut down everything else, whether it was a good one at the time or not. I don't know. I can, t I mean, I do know now it was great. I probably could have handled it a little bit better instead of like, we're doing this, let's go. Yeah. Um, but also with that comes like a massive start over, like massive revenue drops. I've talked about that on the podcast before. I don't think I was prepared for that. But all that to say what it revealed to me was my attachment and validation to external successes. And when that stripped away from you, and, and, and I'd realized that kind of had just been moving throughout my life. It was like dance and then sports and grades and body image right, and all these things. And so I you know, there was a time where I just felt I was like, you know, totally hopeless. I was for sure depressed in like late 2022. Um, and I just remember leaning so much on Justin at this time and he'd already kind of experienced kind of a faith shift. Um, and I know they're all just like watching me like this girl's got to get her stuff together. I'm really good at like keeping it at home, not showcasing. Right. Cause there's this bit of like, I don't want to tell everybody like stuff's happening over here when I'm trying to coach people through this stuff, which you guys as coaches listening know that that happens. And so I started sharing glimpses of what was happening and like, we got so much love back, but 
I remember in this very office at one time, I'd never prayed before in my life (laughs) and the house was empty and I just got down literally on my knees because I was so emotional and I just prayed, God, please take my mind off my business success. I don't know if it's like, if you're a real thing, I don't even know what's happening here, but right now there's something in my heart that says like, I got to pray and just say exactly what I need. And what I needed was to not think about the success of my business. What I needed was to be redirected. And then all of a sudden this like spiritual journey, like really set foot. I started doing 75 hard randomly at the time because I was like so desperate to control something in my life because I felt out of control. And what was really a like a catalyst was, or what was so helpful was the daily, well, two workouts a day, right? Are part of it. Yep. But the walk, I, I turned the second workout into a daily walk outside for 45 minutes. And it was just, I would come back hysterically crying. And um, fast forward through all of that is the lesson is for me it was focus back on the people. I had to close out all my money metrics. I can't, I don't want to look at dashboards around money. I just want to be pleasantly surprised. Um, I want to look at the metrics associated with humans. And um, I have to just like remind myself to like let go and surrender. And I'm like ultimately not really in control of a lot of things. So I'm going to double down on the things I know that are working and be in control of. And I cannot tell you that how crazy Things have happened. I could go on again for hours talking about cool stories around this, but all that to say that I'm working with the people like I dream of working with more consistently. The operations in our business are tightened up. They're focused around the people. Revenue's up 64%, like all these cool markers. Um, I do look at money, um, just not like I used to. Um, But anyway, so I I think, and the way, like, I don't... I don't want to be the coach that leads with my faith. That's not my goal. I'm, I'm not here to teach that, but I am here to just to be a place to let people know, like your faith isn't about church or religion. It's not about doing it the right way. It's about just exploration and leaning in what works for you. And if I can be just a, a model for doing it messy and, you know, uh, whatever that looks like, then I feel like that's part of just things that I want to share in my journey when I'm learning and overthinking it and feeling like an imposter, like a late start. So yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Well, I appreciate you opening up to that and I appreciate you sharing. It's inspirational to myself and others that, that follow your, your journey. Um, I, I'll just, you know, as somebody that follows what you do and we got to be like mastermind together and get to be friends. Like I really appreciate how you show up and I just want to kind of shout you out to everybody that's listening in. Like I, I'm a coach of coaches and I am dug in on the podcasting space. And like when I have a client that needs to level up their coaching game, this is the place that I send them. I send them to Amanda's content um, on purpose. Like she is the best. So if you just found this show, this is your first episode ever. Like, I just want you to know that you're in the exact right place. You're with the exact right leader. And uh, it's, you know, Amanda, somebody that can really, trust in that she's going to steer you in the right direction. So uh, this has been a lot of fun. I, I found out some stuff that I, that I didn't know about you. So that was, that was cool. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just super proud of you, of who you are, how you show up, like I said, and what you're doing, how many people you're helping. I think it's really, really awesome. So uh, with that, I hope all of you uh, didn't mind me taking over the episode. Uh, I appreciate I'm all sure the, the BDC nation out there. Let me, ooh, ooh. let me do that. But uh, it's been a lot of fun. So I'll, I'll yeah. kick it back to you. Thank you. Yeah, it was super fun. I love, I, I like taking a break from my own show and having somebody ask me the questions. I was nervous. Now I don't feel, I'm, I'm good. I feel really good about the whole thing. Um, and if you guys haven't heard Adam before, he has been on another show, another episode rather of the podcast. Two shows, in fact, because here's what's, it was so good as we were recording. He talked all about really prof, making your uh, podcast monetizable, like some of the failures and mistakes that a lot of podcasters will make. But then I was like, Adam, could we just record a coaching clinic episode real quick? And I'd love for you to audit my show. And I've heard so much great feedback of people listening to that show, by the way, of hearing some of the things that they were able to implement. So I'm going to drop both of the links to Adam's um, previous episodes on the BDC podcast. You can catch up with him. But Adam, will you just share more about exactly what you do and where my people can find you too? Yeah. So uh, I am the host of Podcasting Business School. Go go check it out if you are a service provider that wants to learn how to leverage a podcast to build an online business and get more clients. That's what I, I teach on. 
And you can uh, come and hang out on Instagram at Podcasting Business School or my website, podcastingbusiness.school. And Amanda and I are very complimentary of you know, our services and everything really vibes well together. Our content vibes really well together. Um, so yeah, if, if you enjoy this, uh, there's a good chance you uh, will be able to enjoy several of the 500 episodes of Podcasting Business School. Yeah. Shout out to Adam. He just did his 500th episode, which is a massive milestone. So we're applauding you. And what I love about Adam's content is there's a lot of people out there that are teaching like how to start a podcast and what to do. That's the easy part, friends. Starting it is easy. It's keeping it going and growing it with intentional strategies. And that is his magic. And I learn things from him and have learned things that we've implemented as a team. And so um, you definitely don't want to miss out. So tune into his, and he makes really funny videos where he superimposes his face on funny stuff on Instagram. Those crack me up. Like sometimes I don't even realize it's you. I'm like, wait, is that really him? <laughs> like, cause I'll know like the John Travolta or whatever. There's been a few and I'm like, oh my God. Gosh, yeah. how does he freaking do that? I don't even, that's so funny. So yeah. I feel like I need to, to put my face on uh, Tina Turner now. Like, oh, what's yes. love got to, got to do with it? Yeah. I Perfect. See. Yep. And I feel like we might have to even add some of that music to the outro of, of this episode yes. too. So. Um, I'm so grateful that we uh, could switch seats and thank you for the amazing questions and letting me, um, helping me pull me out of my shell because I tend to be like business mode and my podcast um, producer just literally this week sent a video. It's like, Amanda, we'd really like to get to know you more on the podcast. Like, can you share more personal stuff? Like, can we da 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 da? So I think this is great. It, it, it's like I said on your show, sometimes I feel like I'm just not that cool. And I'm like, everybody wants to show up for the business stuff. But I think sometimes we forget we're real humans behind there that have stories. So it's, it's super awesome to be able to share. Yep. Uh, so thank you to you amazing listeners for tuning in, um, celebrating hint, a round of applause for Adam for taking uh, the lead today. And we will see you next week, same time, same place. And until then, go coach him up. <laughs>